This week on the show, we cover TrueOS becoming a downstream fork with Trident. We have our BSD CAN 2018 recap, part one of two. Uh, Harden BSD Foundation uh, founding efforts. We tell you a VPN setup with Open IKD on OpenBSD, uh, FreeBSD on a System76 Galago Pro laptop, and hardware accelerated crypto on Octeons. In this week's episode of BSD Now. BSD Now, episode 250, BSD Can 2018 recap, recorded on the 13th of June 2018. Hello, I'm host Benedict Reuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. We are back from BSD Can. I'm just a little bit jet lagged. Well, by now it's just two days since I landed, so um, I'm right back in the show. And Alan is with me as well, so we should get right into the headlines. But before we talk to you all about the cool stuff that happened at BSD Cam, we have other news from TrueOS. Uh, they're focusing on open, uh, on core operating systems. Of course, they're open. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's funny that they had to add a note to the bump. It's like, the TrueOS project is not changing its name again. Uh, there already is a <laughs> core OS, and they're pretty cool. So. Um. But it says, uh, the TrueOS project has some big plans in the works, and we want to take a minute to share those uh, with the community. Many of you uh, have come to know TrueOS as the graphical version of FreeBSD that makes things easy for newcomers to BSD. Today, we're announcing that TrueOS is shifting our focus a bit to becoming a cutting-edge operating system that keeps all the stability that you know and love from ZFS and FreeBSD while adding additional features to create a fresh, innovative operating system. Our goal is to create a core-centric operating system that is modular, functional, and perfect for do-it-yourselfers and advanced users alike. So TrueOS will become a downstream fork that will build on FreeBSD by integrating new software technologies like OpenRC and LibreSSL. Uh, work has already begun, uh, which will allow TrueOS to be used as a base platform for other projects, including a JSON-based manifest uh, to make it easier to make your own version of TrueOS. Uh, better integration with Poodrear and the package tools, and much, much more. We're planning on a six-month release cycle to keep development fresh and moving, allowing us to bring you hot new features to ZFS, Beehive, and all the related tools in a timely manner. This makes TrueOS the perfect fit uh, to serve as a basis for another, uh, for building other distributions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, if you can kind of get the idea where this is going. Uh, some of you are probably asking yourselves, but what if I want to have a graphical desktop? Don't worry. We're making sure that everyone uh, who knows and loves the legacy desktop version of TrueOS will be able to continue using a FreeBSD-based graphical operating system in the future. For instance, if you want to add KDE, uh, you can just, you know, sudo package install KDE and voila, you have your shiny new desktop. Easy, right? This allows us to get back to our roots and uh, bring a desktop agnostic operating system. If you want to add a new desktop environment, just pick the one that best suits you. Uh, we know that some of you uh, will still be looking for an out-of-the-box solution similar to uh, the legacy PCBSD or TrueOS. Uh, so for that, we're happy to announce that Project Trident uh, will take over graphical FreeBSD development going forward. Not much is going to change in that regard other than the new name. You'll still have your Lumina desktop as a lightweight, feature-rich uh, desktop environment and tons of utilities uh, for the legacy TrueOS toolchain like SysADM and AppCafe. There will be a uh, migration pass available that will make it easy for you to upgrade to these FreeBSD-based distributions set up on top of TrueOS, like Project Triton, or sorry, Project Trident, and GhostBSD will also be switching its base from FreeBSD to the TrueOS uh, manifest system. So they say, we look forward to this new uh, chapter for TrueOS and hope it will give uh, that you will give these new additions a spin. Tell us what you think about these changes by leaving us a comment. Don't forget, you can ask us questions on our Twitter or as part of our community by joining the TrueOS forums where, uh, when they go live in about a week. Uh, thank you for being a loyal fan of TrueOS. Okay, so and they have a, uh, an FAQ here, so we could read well, this we'll back and forth in, in a second. Um, yeah. But so basically, what's happening is TrueOS is 
kind of reverting back to what TrueOS was before uh, PCBASD renamed itself to TrueOS, which is the base operating system that is under uh, FreeNAS and TrueNAS. Uh, and so IX will get back to focusing on building the operating system uh, and Chris uh, and the other uh, TrueOS developers will get back to focusing on building the core of the operating system and the good bits. And then what they've done is built a system to make it very easy to make the kind of distributions of uh, TrueOS on top of it by just specifying, you know, I want TrueOS, but with this desktop and these packages and this look to it. And then you click a couple of buttons and it will make uh, uh, that distribution for you. Uh, and so GhostBSD, one of the GNOME-based desktops of FreeBSD is going to switch to using that platform because it'll make it easier for them to maintain uh, their version. And then Trident will be the basically the continuation of what was PCBSD, where you get your Lumina-based desktop. And, you know, Chris has already mentioned that he might, uh, as an example, just throw together uh, a KDE5-based uh, distro of TrueOS. Ah, uh, yes, that's just Chris' uh, love for the KDE environment. Uh, so now over at, uh, so TrueOS will remain the project that IX uh, pays people to work on and uh, Project Trident uh, will be the now community-driven process of actually building, um, the doing the integration of a desktop environment on top of TrueOS. So now we have uh, their shiny new logo uh, and... Uh, an FAQ that tells us a little bit about what it is. So I guess if you want to read the questions, I can read the answers. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the first question is, why did you pick the name Project Trident? Uh, well, we were looking for a name that was unique, yet would still uh, relate to the BSD community. Since Beastie, the FreeBSD mascot, is always pictured with his trusty trident, you know, that yellow pitchfork looking thing? Uh, mm -hmm. That's a trident. A pitchfork has four tines and... Uh, is different. A trident is, you know, like uh, what's the god of the sea named? Uh, Poseidon. 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 Yes, it's a trident like that. Uh, so they felt that would be a great name. Okay. And the next is where can users go for technical support? Uh, at the moment, uh, Project Trident will continue sharing the TrueOS community forums and the Telegram channels. Uh, we're currently evaluating dedicated options for support channels in the future, as some of those things, uh, you know, Project Trident will continue to add things on top of TrueOS that don't exist in TrueOS, and so it might not make sense to share the support infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But and we the don't next want to one... leave people with a, you know, an empty forum if they have questions, so for now it will continue using the TrueOS stuff. Yeah, and then it will branch off at a certain point. Uh, can I help contribute to the project? Uh, we will always uh, looking for developers who want to join the project. If you're not a developer, you can still help. As a community project, we will be more and more reliant on contributions from the community in the form of how-to guides and other user-centric documentation and support. And, you know, some of this stuff, you don't really need to be a C developer uh, to help put together manifests and uh, the stuff you need to do to make uh, a successful desktop operating system, um, you know. There's a, a lot of stuff that you can help with as a non-developer. Yeah, for sure. Uh, how is the project supported financially? Uh, project Trident is sponsored by the community, both through individual and corporate donations. IX Systems has stepped up as the first enterprise-level sponsor of the project uh, and has been instrumental in getting Project Trident up and running. Uh, so please visit the sponsor page to see all the current sponsors and to donate. Mm-hmm. And how can I help support the project financially? Uh, there are several methods that exist. Uh, from For one-time and recurring donations, PayPal is the easiest one. Uh, and they're also looking at limited-time swag options like t-shirts uh, campaigns that will be coming later in the year. We're also looking into alternative methods of support, so please visit the sponsor page to see all the currently supported methods. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, will there be any transparency of the financial donations and expenditures? I say yes. It will be totally open with how much money comes into the project and what it gets spent on. Due to concerns of privacy, we will not identify the individual donors and their donation amounts, 
unless they specifically request to be identified. Uh, we will release a monthly overview of, uh, you know, a income and expenses ledger uh, so that the community can see where the money uh, donated to the project is being spent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the relationships with TrueOS are also uh, being discussed or questioned uh, after? Project Trident uh, does have a very close tie to the TrueOS project since most of its original Project Trident developers uh, were once part of the TrueOS project before it became a distribution platform. For users of the TrueOS desktop, we have some additional question and answers below. Mm -hmm. Uh, do we need to be at a certain TrueOS install level or release to upgrade? Uh, as long as you have a TrueOS system that has been updated to at least the 2018-03 release, you should be able to just perform a regular system update to automatically be upgraded to Project Trident. Okay. And which members moved from TrueOS to the Project Trident? Uh, Project Trident is being led by prior members of the TrueOS de uh, desktop team. Uh, since the focus is on the desktop, uh, the people working on underlying OS stay with TrueOS, but the desktop people move over to Trident. So that's uh, Ken Moore, who developed Lumina, uh, and JT, who's also the producer of the show here. Uh, and as well as the Tim Moore, who will move over to Trident to work on documentation to make sure that uh, you always know how to do everything. Uh, and Rod uh, will do community and support work uh, for Trident. Uh, and since Project Trident is a community-first project, we look forward to growing the team uh, with community members. Mm, excellent. All right. That's about uh, Trident. And, of course, we'll let you know if there are future developments in that space. Yep. Uh, and, you know, it'll be interesting to see what other uh, spins of TrueOS come out of that now that it'll be that much easier to build one. Yeah, what kind of downstream things will develop upon that, or there's a super nice desktop um, uh, alternative to KDE developing. Whatever it is, we'll see. Yep. So, uh, this week's episode of BSD Now, and basically all the previous news story there, uh, is brought to you by iX Systems. Head over to iXSystems.com and check out the ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source. Mm hmm of course, they were also at the conference that we we're going to talk about in a little while, BSD Can. They mm -hmm. were sponsors and had a table there uh, showing up their new M series. That was kind okay. of interesting. And they also sponsored uh, the social event at the end of the conference. Oh, yes. Thanks for that. So they're also um, bringing a lot of people to the conference and sponsoring those. Um, I think they had a record attendance this year of 20 people. So all over... Uh, from documentation, development, of course. And uh, yeah, that was a good uh, outcome. Indeed. So and we could uh, see if yeah. you need hardware, you should head over to iX Systems and let them know what it is you're trying to do with open source, and they will help you build the best server to do the job. Yeah, whether it's a small server for, for your backup needs in the office or uh, in a small company, that's probably something that a FreeNAS Mini or FreeNAS Mini XL up to the big server rack for your, let's say, big data needs or whatever kind of data you want to store. Mm -hmm. Or you want to have a good combination of CPU and memory, just give them a call and they will tell you exactly for your use case what's the best machine they can build for you. Yes, uh, you know, it's very valuable to talk to a bunch of the developers that are employed at iX to making sure that ZFS is the best that it can be on FreeBSD. Yes, they know um, how the system component works together, which drivers are available, and how uh, much performance they can deliver. So that's the exact thing you want to know from your uh, hardware vendor. And most hardware vendors just don't know about FreeBSD at all. So iX Systems yeah, uses... Let alone know exactly which hardware you want with free uh with zfs and so on so yeah we have a special treat before we get to our trip reports from bsd can we have one from uh ix employee michael dexter uh we have a, a special advanced leaked copy uh this will be up on their website later today but we have this advanced copy um so it says, as a recap of BSD CAN 2018, the 15th annual BSD CAN took place uh, during the first week of June and saw record attendance uh, by users and developers from around the world, including many, many members of the iX Systems team. It was an honor to 
sponsor the Saturday Night Social event and to be part of North America's largest BSD conference. BSD Can is special uh, for starting at connecting airports around the world and ending informally at cafes around the Byward Market in Ottawa. Celebrating its 15th year, BSD Can 2018 uh, tied with the previous BSD Can 2015 uh, for a record number of attendees. I guess that just spoiled the joke we were going to make later. Yes, this uh. year's BSD Can was the biggest BSD Can ever, beating the previous BSD Can by zero people. <laughs> Tying the record. Uh, this made for a busy uh, but never crowded event where the hallway track was always just as important as the session tracks Uh, choosing which concurrent session uh, to miss and deciding where to eat is probably the two most difficult decisions that any BSD can attendee faces Uh, because yes uh, even during lunch we had uh, boffs going on Uh, so you got you got your lunch and then it was like which of the four topics would I like to listen to and talk about while I eat my lunch? Yeah, that's uh, difficult. So, mm-hmm. yeah, especially at this, this year's conference. Yeah, so the first social event of uh, BSD Can traditionally now is the Goat Boff, uh, a Birds of a Feather session where everybody meets up at uh, the Royal Oak before the conference starts and uh, celebrates uh, <laughs> with Groff and, you know, get reintroduced to all of our friends that we maybe haven't seen for a whole year. You know, many weary travelers uh, can unwind and catch up with the colleagues and rarely have the pleasure of seeing in person. Uh, then mildly rested and acclimated, attendees <laughs> and speakers then start a mix of tutorials and developer summits and, you know, last minute presentation preparation for some people. <laughs> Who would do that? I don't know what they're talking Not about. Not me this time. I was, I was prepared. <laughs> it helped that I gave a slightly shorter version of the same talk at a different conference a, a couple of weeks before. <laughs> <laughs> but the FreeBSD Dev Summit featured highly uh, constructive discussions about proposed features like the OpenRC init system and uh, packaging the base system, which has been undergoing evaluation in TrueOS for consideration for inclusion in FreeBSD. Both projects ranked uh, remarkably well for balanced technological innovation without violating the principle of least astonishment you know we don't want to surprise the user when they upgrade that something they depended on isn't there anymore or something like that and then the tutorials provided hands-on instructions for all kinds of things including bgp ansible pf and libre ssl and then i have lots more there if you want to read uh michael's recap of bsd can uh, go over to ixsystems.com slash blog and check it out. Mm -hmm. I'm reliably informed that tomorrow there'll be a second trip report from somebody else that attended as well. (laughs) Yeah, so that's uh, that's going to happen in the next weeks. We will flood you with BSD CAN recaps and uh, trip reports. Yep. So moving on to our recap of uh, BSD CAN. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's been a great conference, and it started for me on the Friday before, so the, mm-hmm. the first of June. I went there a little bit earlier to, um, you know, uh, get there a bit earlier, do a bit of uh, sightseeing. We went to Montreal over the Sunday, uh, Saturday. No, it was Sunday, Monday, um, and do a little bit of sightseeing there un, uh, until the rain started falling down on Monday. Uh, but the the week, the day before, was actually quite hot, and I got a little bit of sunburn. So, yeah. In Canada, yeah. mind you. So, <laughs> but it was great. Um, I got there with the Z Repl developer uh, Christian Schwartz, who was there for his first time in Canada and at the conference, mm-hmm. of course. And yeah, that was a great time. I spoke in the first few days a lot of German for whatever reason, and then <laughs> had to switch over to English. Um, uh, yeah, you two but, should have switched earlier and and got yeah. your English all exercised, <laughs> all mixed up. <laughs> exercised. Yep. Yeah, yeah uh, so I, we came up on the Sunday, uh, and then, you know, by the time we got there, it was nighttime, so we didn't do much. But on yeah, Monday, uh, we met up with uh, Michael and Liz Lucas and had breakfast, uh, and then we met up with uh, Adam, who organizes the hotels for all the attendees, uh, or all the speakers anyway, uh, and his wife, and a bunch of us went to the Science and Technology Museum. 
Uh, we got a little bit of a special behind the scenes version of the tour uh, because Adam had worked on setting up a lot of the infrastructure, the IT infrastructure uh, for the museum itself. And so we kind of got a behind the scenes in addition to seeing, you know, the people that worked there's favorite versions of different exhibits. Also just uh, understanding some of the IT stuff that was going on behind the scenes and, you know, how they're using the ticket system to track problems with the displays and, uh, you know, how they used computers to control the lights and, and some of the interactive exhibits. Uh, and cool. that was cool. And then uh, once we broke off from that, we watched a pyrotechnics display uh, and then went to the Lego exhibit, uh, which uh, I think there are some pictures of coming up shortly. Okay. So that was Monday. Uh, and then Tuesday, I went to the Canadian War Museum uh, didn't get to see all of it. I was on a, a bit short for time because I had to meet up later in the day. Uh, but I went through uh, prehistory to 1885 and then uh, 1885 through the end of World War One, and then a little bit of World War Two, And then I went to the big hangar and just uh, ogled vehicles for an hour. <laughs> yeah, I've yet yeah. to go to that uh, museum. It's still on my to visit list. Yes, uh, well, if you want to see a collection of tanks from World War One and Two all the way up to modern stuff, uh, it's definitely worth a look. There's also we had you know, to... combat snowmobiles and. Ooh, uh, yeah. Well, we did the the, the Ottawa um, tour that starts at the um, War Memorial, and that mm -hmm. pretty much drive around and hop on, hop hop off tour uh, with Christian, who hasn't seen it before. It was very windy on that day, but um, that was still a cool tour. So we yeah. got a little. When we were driving city. up on Sunday, the rain was really heavy, and then Monday it rained a while while we were inside the the museum, but that didn't really deter us too much. Yeah, and then on Tuesday evening, uh, as we already mentioned in Dexter's trip report, the goat buff started at the Royal Oak Pub, uh, so where people had a chance to meet and greet and, uh, you know, recap every uh, last uh, event they went to and, you know, all the happenings in the BSD world. Unfortunately, I could not attend that one because the Tuesday uh, had an all-day FreeBSD Foundation meeting. That's our annual board meeting. We have to, you know, elect uh, the, the usual uh, members again, you know, the president, the vice president, the secretary and treasurer. And um, also, you know, in the evening also had after a little dinner, uh, a journal editorial board meeting to determine what kind of future issues the FreeBSD journal will have. Well, there's a picture of the back of my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, so it's, I'm uh, showing off cool. some pictures from the goat buff here. You see lots of people meeting up. Uh, we got there a little bit late, but not too late. And I got to talk to Matt Ahrens and Sarah Hartsey about some uh, work I had done on ZFS since the last time I spoke to them at uh, the ZFS user conference, uh, but a month and a bit before, um, or two months before, I guess, uh, and uh, talked to a bunch of other people. It was you know nice to get to catch up with people that I haven't seen for a while. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so that um, that went on for a while, I guess. Um, some people just uh, couldn't finish, and uh, well, were a bit tired on the next day, uh, which uh, started the actual. So these are the two days of tutorials for the conference, but in parallel, there's the free, uh, FreeBSD Dev Summit happening. So that's also two days, and uh, Gordon Tetlow organized uh, the Dev Summit with a bunch of help from others, and he opened the Dev Summit. Welcome everyone. And then uh, let Deb Goodkin take the stage to talk about the uh, FreeBSD Foundation uh, efforts in, uh, you know, education and uh, development and some other things like uh, how many new people we get on board. So Li Wen is now working working at the foundation to assist in quality assurance. Uh, so Jenkins uh, continuous integration, continuous de deployment that he already did, but now in a more uh, formal role, focusing on on that whole. Huh. He gets to uh, work on it full time instead of just as a volunteer. Yeah, exactly. That should get things um, uh, started more quickly or more um, consistently having someone who can take care of that, like we have for Glenn Barber with the release engineering team. And also Gordon Tetlow itself uh, had a part has a part-time contract at the moment uh, to help SEC team as their secretary. So these two positions took at least... Uh, half a year or maybe one year to set up with all, you know, 
uh, behind the scenes talk and you know financing and all that it took a while but i'm happy that we got both of them and um, now they can do their work um, in their respective areas so that was her update um, and a couple of questions were asked i think if i'm not mistaken mm-hmm. uh yeah and then it was the core team uh, session uh, where Ellen and I were also uh, on the stage with the other core team members who were there. Uh, the only one who wasn't there was George Neville Neal, uh, unfortunately, this year. He couldn't come. Uh, but everyone else, including core secretary, was there. And we gave an overview talk of the things that we um, did in the last two years because – you remember, there's a core election going on still. I think we have a week left yeah, or so. Well, and so. We get the frequent question, you know, what is core doing about it? So we <laughs> have a short presentation <laughs> recapping all the things we've done in the last two years. And, you know, it was a lot more work than it sounded like. <laughs> yeah, so we could fill almost an hour. And um, mm-hmm. we, know, we kind of got a bunch of questions from the audience. So generally people are were interested in the core work and what it entails. And yeah, I think that was a good session overall. Yep. Um, yeah. So the then was a coffee break because uh, that was around uh, uh, lunchtime almost. No, no, it was uh, ten thirty from the from the schedule here. Um, after that, we had a release engineering talk. Um, because people wanted to know, or at least we wanted to show that release engineering is important and what kind of role it has in making the release work or get out on time and what kind of efforts are needed to make that um, happen in time and in good quality. And uh, Marius presented that. And there were also a couple of questions, or at least... Yes, uh, uh, we also comments. had a uh, somewhat lengthy discussion about... Um, the code freezes and how we do that, especially for the major versions, uh, how we're trying to get the rate of churn in that in head down uh, so that we can have a stable release, uh, while at the same time trying to balance that with not disrupting the development cycle uh, too much either. Um, it seems like we're going to not make any changes in time for 12, but maybe uh, for next time we will look at having the freezes be a bit shorter. Uh, the other thing that was raised was how we should maybe enforce uh, temporary code freezes if there's too much breakage in the tree, if uh, the rate of churn is causing repeated breakage and, you know, uh, the the tinderbox system detects that uh, we've not had a successful build in X uh, amount of time uh, that we institute a temporary code freeze until all the breakages are fixed um, before we allow development to continue. Yeah, that's uh, Although important. That's form. maybe more reactive instead of proactive, where you know the changes should be. Uh, we should find those breakages before they're committed, instead of the other way around. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a good thing. But generally, having an overview of what release engineering does and how many people are involved mm-hmm. is uh, good and to see. And talking about the schedule for twelve because that's coming up very soon, and we have a lot of work to get done for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the afternoon um, was, um, we split up, at least I had to go to my Ansible tutorial in the afternoon, which went for pretty much the rest of the afternoon for three hours with a break in between. Uh, so I had roughly 15 people, um, most of them beginners, a couple of them a bit more advanced, and we had some good discussions as I presented the, the slides and went through the material. Uh, people uh, always asked questions and, uh, you know, there was a little bit of um, back and forth. Uh, but also uh, very productive, and I also got a few suggestions uh, for modules or for um, uh, using Factor to get even more facts from a remote operating system. Uh, so that was new to me, and that is the nice thing that you're not only presenting something, but you also get uh, something to learn yourself. And uh, feedback was overall positive from uh, the people that I talked to, and, well, of course, <laughs> they probably didn't want to tell me uh, bad stuff in my face. Um, but, but that's okay. Um, and one even asked what I'm going to teach next year, so I have to come up. Um, <laughs> but I have a whole year to think about that, so yeah, that's good to know that people want to see me again. Uh, but you went to a working group, Alan, in that time frame? Yep. Uh, so there were three working, or yeah, two working groups going on uh, after lunch. Uh, the first was called Clearing Deadwood. It was about uh, clearing up older code in the operating system. That's, uh, for example, old drivers or devices that you haven't been able to buy for 10 years. 
that were never popular to begin with uh, and cleaning those up so as not to haul around the extra technical debt for no reason. Um, so there was uh, some of that. Uh, and then the competing session was packaging base where we talked through uh, some of the problems and limitations we have now uh, with that and going forward, uh, how to you know try to get that project finished. It's been going on for a couple of years now and uh, oh. isn't quite ready to land. Was um, that more of a hackathon thing or just uh, discussions? The second half after the break was a hackathon, which ah. involved more time at the whiteboard with the, the important people figuring out what was going on. Uh, also, during that break uh, is when we had the 25th anniversary cake uh, from FreeBSD. And I was it? Was the it? look on Benedict's face that he maybe didn't get any cake. <laughs> no, wait. That must have been on the second day because I was there oh. when Deb was cutting the cake. That Possibly must have been was something. the second day, yes. Yeah, my because mind. I couldn't get out of my um, uh, tutorial. During the break yeah, to get so some cake? I, I did get that cake, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. And then uh, after the break, uh, the second sessions were uh, open RC. Uh, and explaining that to people, and then the um, the hackathon yeah. for packaging base. And I think uh, in the other room that was supporting a hackathon, we also had a um, a talk about some of the uh, the crypto framework in FreeBSD uh, for accelerating uh, things like crypto offload on some of the newer network cards and so on. Yeah, so we couldn't be in that those rooms. Um, but if someone has been there and wants to report on that, send us in, and yes. we'll that in the show uh yeah good good I, I hear good things from the open rc group they are um they had a lot of uh, enthusiastic people in there and they want to make things happen let's just say that um, i don't see that there are any um objections that far they just need to do a bit of work to get that integrated in one way or the other Um, yeah, that was uh, anything. Oh, okay. of course. Then uh, after that, everyone had a bit of time off to uh, unwind. But then there was a um, a dinner for developers in the uh, uh, Henderson residence. We couldn't have the hackathon or the hacker lounge in the um, Unity residence this year. So although the room was pretty much empty the whole time, I looked at it. So. I don't know what went on there, but um, that was the Henderson residence that had more uh, tables in space. It's a bit further out from the from the venue, but uh, people were there and um, took the walk there. So that was the dinner with basically pizza. I didn't go there for that for one reason. There was some kind of dinner going on. So, <laughs> but when I came back, there were a lot of empty pizza cartons and people were uh, still talking. So <laughs> that uh, seems to have been gone well. And then the next day, June 7th, is the second day of the FreeBSD Dev Summit. Uh, Gordon also opened that one, um, giving a much longer talk, actually, uh, with an insight into the FreeBSD SEC team, uh, which is basically handling all the security in FreeBSD, the security vulnerabilities, you know, uh, security issues they have to, to deal with. or Yeah, uh, uh, so there's talk about uh, some of the different vulnerabilities and how they were handled uh, and... Um, in particular, the debug uh, vulnerability that came out uh, that was coordinated by Microsoft and how well that went, and using that as a case study and in general trying to have more uh, vulnerabilities handled that way than some of the other ways they've uh, been handled over time. Uh, and there was a bit of talk about how still a bit too much of the vulnerability management stuff is, you know, there's not... Uh, conscious selection of who gets included in whatever is just like, oh, I happen to know a guy at that project, so we can reach out to that person uh, and trying to formalize some of that and, and just uh, hoping to have uh, more of these uh, disclosures handled the way uh, that the, the most successful ones have been handled. Mm. And he also described how the process works um, that takes place when there's a security vulnerability uh, by explaining it uh, from an old advisory that they did so um, a while back so that they people can see what what's involved in just 
getting the right people and also writing up the whole text about the advisories and all these things. Um, that's a lot of work. Yep. Um, and then there was also talk about creating a new security architecture team. Um, so currently, uh, a number of bits of code review or, uh, you know, commits don't go in because they're waiting for review by sec team. And the way the current sec team is structured, they're basically completely uh, set up for the dealing with the vulnerability disclosure stuff uh, and not necessarily the right resource to review changes to crypto drivers uh, or the random number generator and so on. So looking at actually creating a separate security architecture team to do code reviews on things like the disk encryption changes, the random number generator, generator changes, changes to the crypto frameworks, uh, crypto offload code, AES and I code, etc., and having a, a separate group for that that's not gated on approval by sec team, which is busy, you know, in a responsive role dealing with uh, the vulnerabilities and so on. Yeah. And some of these require really deep knowledge into certain mm -hmm. code bases. And, yeah, and that, you know, we, there, we can't get a security officer that's going to have deep knowledge of every one of these things. And so moving the code review part off to a security architecture team probably makes more sense and hopefully will allow uh, remove some current roadblocks that are in place. Mm -hmm. ah, and yeah. then after the break, uh, we had our FreeBSD 12 session, a bit different than uh, some previous FreeBSD 12 sessions in that it was less aspirational and more, you know, these are the list of things that we really need to get finished before code slash starts uh, in two months. So, you know, <laughs> and actually making sure each one of these is assigned to a person. Uh, and uh, Rod Gimes from the release engineering team uh, has taken to, uh, took the notes from that and created a set of Bugzilla bugs uh, and set up so the release engineering team can track each of those projects and how it's going uh, and trying to get all those things wrapped up and finished and committed and working and tested uh, by the start of the code slash uh, so that we can uh, have a more high quality release. Yep, that's always and and also it's like, oh, we want to get this feature in, but it's still not finished. So let's keep it out to make it um, not a disappointment for people. And so we put it in twelve point one, whatever. Uh, well, that and be. for some of it, because the ABI is locked well, after twelve, and you can't go and change the ABI to add the feature in twelve point one, is which shims and placeholders do we need to get into the ABI? in 12.0, even if we're not going to use them until 12.1. Yeah. So features are ready when they're ready, uh, but people should still uh, assign to them and work on them to make it yes. uh, and, uh, happen. You know, so actually, you can see here the release engineering schedule, uh, but you can find that on the freebsd.org website. Yeah, the full listing and uh, what people plan to do. Uh, then we had lunch, and then we took the group photo, uh, both regular and in 360 version. Yep, that was uh, a so new gadget. <laughs> so every people, everyone looking around the whole camera. Yep. Uh, and then and afternoon? Then we had uh, th uh, two different working groups, the transport group, which is focused on networking and TCP, uh, and the open ZFS group, where we uh, had recaps of what had been going on with... Uh, ZFS since last year and uh, with some of the features that we have now that you might not have heard about, features that are coming very soon, and then features that are uh, coming down the road. Uh, we also had a talk about um, some changes in the Open ZFS uh, project and now that a lot of development is happening in Linux first, uh, considering changing FreeBSD's um, kind of to not necessarily use Solaris uh, or the open ZFS repo as the source of upstream so much as cherry pick features from any other ZFS implementation uh, and kind of, you know, doing that the right way. Yep. Uh, for me, it was a bit, just a couple of people talking and the rest of the room was like, whoa, you're very deep into the code. Um, but still oh, interesting. Yes. Uh, Alexander Moten also had... Uh, some 
performance graphs uh, and, and flame graphs looking into some particular performance problems he's seeing with very high speed devices uh, and you know using the chance uh, to to talk with the other uh, people that you know there's there's only a handful of people in the world that are ready to discuss that topic uh, <laughs> and if if more than two of them are in the room at once you might as well start uh, pulling out the flame <laughs> graphs and figuring out what's going on <laughs> yep so I don't uh, know whether that then, Yep, uh, that's that's making progress, and uh, you know, uh, I also raised a couple of questions I had, and and got some ideas on how we're going to deal with some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And Matt Aaron's was always great to answer those, and he has this, you know, the relaxedness and still the technical debt to to answer all this uh, in the detail it requires. Yep, uh, and then the second half of the afternoon. Uh, the transport group continued uh, their work, and we had a boot code working group uh, where we talked about a number of different things, including um, trying to commonize some of the boot code, some of the changes we made recently, uh, the Lua versus Forth stuff, and also um, trying to finish the Geli stuff. Uh, there are now actually two separate projects on that. Uh, the one by Ian Lepore will actually extend... Uh, it has a lot of very important cleanup on my original legacy implementation of Geli. Uh, and after that cleanup is able to extend it to work on architectures other than x86. Uh, so that you would be able to boot ARM64 servers from encrypted ZFS root. Um, yeah. And so on. And that actually partway extends it into the EFI stuff. And then uh, also just having Eric McCorkle, who's done the work to get uh, EFI Geli boot uh, into FreeBSD um, in the same room as, as as some of the other people, so we can get that deconflicted and committed as well. Um, so it's very good to have just those people in one room for an hour, uh, which is the reason why we have these Dev summits. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's so not a lot just because we all are friends and like to hang out. It's just we actually can accomplish more in an hour in a room together than we can. Uh, with sometimes much more time over email. Yeah, yeah that's there's um, not much uh, that's more valuable than an actual in-person in interaction. Yeah, indeed. So they just go in a corner or have a hallway track a little bit uh, besides the the normal track, and then things happen. Yes, that's uh, at least. Uh, oh, we have a couple of IX Systems photos from BSD Can as well, but of course this is just the Dev Summit and the tutorials of the first two days. Yes, uh, but we've already kind of gone too long on that, uh, so we will pick up and talk about the main days of the conference. Uh, well, next week <laughs> you're gonna have to yep. wait. <laughs> we covered like the first five days, uh, you know, the many days of pre-conference and the first two days of the conference. Uh, getting deeper into the conference, you're going to have to wait for next week, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that will require a whole uh, extra show for coverage. Yeah, but uh, do check out all the pictures. Um, the first set from Olivier Verber, uh has many of the pictures annotated so that you can actually put names to the faces. Uh, and uh, there's some ever going on to actually attach names to the rest of the people as well uh, as we try to get, uh, you know, you'll be able to tell who's who, which is uh, something that's often been requested. Yeah, for people who have never been there and just looking at the picture, who well, is that? In particular, it's like, uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time working with so-and-so, but I've yet to actually find out what they look like. <laughs> yeah, really yeah that's very helpful. To the face, uh, and so on. So, time for the news roundup this week. We have the June HardenBSD Foundation update. So, this is over at the HardenBSD website, of course, hardenbsd.org. And they write, uh, or Sean Webb writes, who was also at the conference, uh, we at HardenBSD are working towards starting a 501c3 not-for-profit organization in the United States. Setting up this organization will allow future donations to, the, to be tax-deductible. And we've made progress and would like to share with you the current state of affairs. We have identified, in, uh, sent invitations out, and received acceptance letters from six people who will give uh, or who will serve on the Harden BSD Foundation Board of Directors. So we have you have to have a, a couple of people on a board of directors that's 
just a requirement by law. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find their BIOS below in the latter half, in the latter half of the 2018 uh, of June, in the beginning half of July 2018. They will have uh, their meeting for the first time as a board and formally begin the process of creating the documentation needed to submit to the local, state, and federal tax services. So that this is officially registered, and um, then you can get the tax donation. Yeah, there's uh, quite a bit of setup. Uh, in, in creating a not-for-profit. I remember, you know, Justin did a lot of work to get the FreeBSD Foundation to be a... Yeah, it's not something you would do on a, on a rainy afternoon. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it also requires um, some waiting time and, you know, fees and, uh, yeah, some legal counsel. But certainly it's, it's uh, doable and you just need to have to drive for it. Uh, so here's a brief introduction to those who will serve on the board. Uh, the first one is... W. Dean Freeman as an advisor. Uh, Dean has 10 years of professional experience with deploying and security Unix and networking systems, including sessions, assessing, sorry, assessing systems, security for government certification and assessing the efficacy of um, security products. He has introduced, uh, what was introduced to Unix via FreeBSD 2.2.8, wow, on an ISP shell account as a teenager, Formerly, uh, he, has, uh, he was on the uh, Snort port maintaining team for FreeBSD while working in the Salesfire VRT and has contributed entropy-related patches to the FreeBSD and HardenBSD projects, a topic on which he presented at VBSDCon 2017. Yep. Dean is a very smart person. Yep. So... Um, then second is Ben LaMonica as an advisor too. Uh, ben is a senior technology manager of software engineering at Morningstar Inc Incorporated and has been developing software for over 15 years in a variety of languages. He advocates open source software and enjoys tinkering with electronics and home automation. Uh, the next person is uh, George Saylor, as uh, also an advisor. Uh, George is a technical director at G2. Uh, Mr. Saylor has over 28 years of information systems and security experience in a broad range of disciplines. His core focus areas are automation and standards in the event correlation space, as well as penetration and exploitation of computer systems. Mr. Saylor has also co uh, was also co-founder of the OpenSCAP project. Uh, number four on the board will be Virginia Suidan as an accountant and general administrator. Accountant and general administrator for the Harden BSD Foundation. She has worked with Sean Webb for tax and accounting purposes for over six years. And then there's Sean Webb itself, him, himself, of course, uh, as a director, uh, the co-founder of HardenBSD and all-around InfoSec Monk. Uh, he has worked and played in the InfoSec industry, doing both offensive and defensive research for around 15 years, uh, loves open source technologies, and likes to frustrate the bad guys. And number six, as uh, Ben Welch, as an advisor, uh, Ben is currently a security engineer at G2. He graduated from Pennsylvania College of Technology with a Bachelor's of Information Assurance and Security. Uh, ben likes long walks, uh, beaches, candlelight dinners, and attending various conferences like B-Sides and ShmooCon. Okay, that's uh, news from the HeartBSD project. So next up, we have uh, a how-to on creating your own VPN using the Open IKD in OpenBSD. Ah, well, VPN is always good to have, mm -hmm. especially so when you're at the conference yeah. <laughs> or uh, just the uh, crappy hope now on Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, remote connectivity to your home network is something I think a lot of people find desirable. Over the years, I've established an SSH tunnel and used it for SOX proxy and things like that, uh, sending my traffic through that. It's a nice solution for a poor man's VPN, uh, but it can be a bit clunky and it's not great having to expose SSH to the world, uh, even if it makes you lock everything down. Uh, so I set out the other day to finally do it properly. I came across a post by Gordon Turner uh, on how to run a VPN endpoint for iOS and macOS from OpenBSD 6.2. While this is exactly what I was looking for, it outlined how to set up an L2TP VPN. Really, I wanted IPsec. Uh, and so IKV2 for performance and security reasons. And, you know, won't elaborate, but you can find out more if you care. Uh, the client systems I'd be using uh, all have native support for IKV2, including iOS, macOS, and other BSD systems. But I couldn't find any tutorials on this uh, kind of specific version of it. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, decided to attack the problem. Uh, this guide will walk you through the setup of an Ike v2 VPN using OpenIkeD on OpenBSD. It will 
detail a road warrior configuration. Uh, so, you know, connecting your laptop back to your home when you're on the road uh, and use pre-shared keys for authentication. I'm sure it can be easily adapted to work with other platforms that OpenID is available on, but keep in mind that these instructions are for OpenBSD. Uh, so for your server, uh, as with all my home infrastructures, I crafted the setup uh, declaratively. So I had the deployment of a VM set up with Terraform, uh, developed on a private Triton cluster, and wrote the configuration in Ansible and then tied them together using uh, the Terraform provisioner Ansible module. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I love Ansible is that its syntax is very simplistic yet expressive. As such, I feel it's uh, very well, it fits into explaining these steps uh, as snippets of a playbook. Okay, uh, so makes sense, yeah. First bit is setting up the sysctl parameters. First off, we need to alter the kernel state so it's fit to manage VPN traffic. Naturally, parameters we're going to uh, be setting are in the internet space in uh, sysctl. So we set um, net.inet.ip.forwarding so that traffic in the one interface will be forwarded out the other so that you'll actually be able to pass traffic around. Enable the ESP and AH so that uh, you can set up IPsec and also enable IPcomp. Okay. And then he translates that Ansible playbook into the raw commands uh, in case you're new to Ansible. Yep. That's the... uh, then he also creates the naughty list, a list of uh, <laughs> networks that you're going to block automatically uh, and shows how that's set up. But then we set the host name, uh, configure the IP address on the interface. So now we're going to run an IPsec and have an encapsulation interface and set its IP address and netmask and so on. Uh, then we can configure the firewall, make it a pf.conf that basically uh, blocks the bad guys and allows our IPsec traffic through and reloads pf once it's uh, the files in place. Then we need to configure the IKD service. Uh, so we set up our ikd.conf and set our pre-shared key. So we configure who's allowed uh, what through the VPN daemon. And then we start the Ike service and we're pretty much good to go. Then we just have to uh, configure the machine to actually proxy traffic around. And uh, now we have our server. And then it walks through the client configuration for setting up the VPN on iOS so for your uh, iPhone or whatever. And then it has uh, how to do it on your Mac OS, how to deal with uh, troubleshooting you might run into, uh, how to make sure you know your network connectivity is working right, uh, how to watch the traffic as it goes back and forth, etc. cetera. So that right. should be everything right. you need uh, to get your VPN going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. But, you know, Sometimes your connection at home isn't all that fast. Uh, and you want somewhere you could VPN to that's got a little bit of speed under the belt. So head over to digitalocean.com and check them out where you can stand up uh, a BSD VM uh, with a gig of memory and a terabyte of internet traffic uh, for just $5 a month. So you splat that same VPN configuration down on there, uh, and now you can get out from behind the hotel's Wi-Fi or whatever onto something <laughs> faster. Plus, uh, because with DigitalOcean, you get to pick locations, whether you want uh, San Francisco, Toronto, New York, London, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, Bangalore, or Singapore, you can always have your VPN endpoint be not that far away from the hotel, uh, meaning it'll be a bit faster. Yeah, so you don't have to wait until the packets arrive around the world. Yeah. So Plus, that gives you... You could also have your house connect out to the VPN on the internet. And now, when you connect hmm. to that uh, server, um, you'll also be able to reach into your house, um, but you didn't have to, you know, if your house doesn't, say, have a static IP address, uh, and you're not going to be able to, 
you know, find it when you're off in a hotel in some foreign land or whatever, <laughs> having your house dial out to the static v, uh, VPN server and your laptop dial out allow you to kind of not have to deal with opening up ports or something and knowing the IP address of your home when you're off, you know, gallivanting at a conference. <laughs> Or for the mayor, for the more stay-at-home folks or just want to run servers, they can also run those on the DigitalOcean droplets, like uh, the one-click apps that give you on the spot a MongoDB cluster or MongoDB server at least, or if you want to run a WordPress blog or um, just a MySQL server, that's already available. So you only have to select it and then it will be instantiated for you within seconds. Yeah, or in my case, on Monday, it was like, oh, look, I have this new thing that needs to be separate from all my previous things and it needs a mail server <laughs> and I need it ASAP. Uh, yeah. You know, 45 seconds of clicking around on the uh, DigitalOcean website and boom, I had a brand new FreeBSD instance running. Uh, package install, postfix, devcot, open dkim, uh, etc. And spam D, I guess, uh, spam assassin. Then I had a mail server up and running. Uh, which was really nice to have. Oh, and did you have to share that mail server with other people? Like yeah. with the team management? Uh, yes, and I also uh, invited other people to the team setup in DigitalOcean so that if I'm not available, other people will be able to log into the account and uh, you know restart that VM or upgrade it or manage it or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool because only one person, you can configure it in a way that one person sees the bill. The other people uh, are only doing the management parts, so you can separate yes, or, it still. You, know, you can even go further than that and designate uh, a person, other people. You, know, you have your account owner, and then you have the people that uh, have access to the billing, and then you have the people that only have access to the droplets. Yep. Or things like load balancers and floating IPs and block storage. It's all available in DigitalOcean for you to use. Yeah, I, I predict block storage in our future there. so Yeah, it, it's coming. Uh, and well, if you want to uh, try it out. That particular VM I set up on Monday is likely going to need it soon. <laughs> yeah, and the nice thing about DigitalOcean, it can grow with demand. So if your box is too small or doesn't have the right performance anymore, then just size up and give it a little bit more CPUs or more memory. So that's all happening and easy to do in DigitalOcean. Yep. And they made it even easier with their new flexible size droplets, uh, where, you know, where you can uh, pick between uh, three different sizes for the same price. And they made the storage the same, so you can switch back and forth between these just by restarting the droplet. It's super easy. Yep. So, so head over to DigitalOcean.com and sign up. If you've not signed up before, go to do, as in DigitalOcean, dot co slash BSD now, and you will get a $100 credit to play with in your account. It's great. Uh, that expires after 60 days. Uh, or if you already have an account, uh, you can use the coupon code FreeBSD now, and they will give you a $10 credit that does not expire. Yep. Uh, if you'd use up the $10, um, for testing, that's that's great. Or you just run it for, yeah, a couple of times with a very small uh, droplet. So no matter how you use it, uh, it's a good way to get started and trying out DigitalOcean. Yes, and when it starts at five dollars a month, it can't get much cheaper than that. Yeah, so that gives you a good uh, amount of time to to try out uh, how it's how it works for you. All right, All right. Um, moving on. Now we have a blog post about running FreeBSD on the System76 Galago Pro. Yeah, for the people who are still looking for a new laptop, this might be a good alternative because most yeah, of the uh, stuff this seems is, to be supported. Yeah, uh, also this is the one that Colin Percival has and he spent quite a bit of effort uh, making it better on FreeBSD. Ah, so this is, hey all, uh, it's been a while since I last posted, but I thought I would hammer something out. Uh, my recent uh, purchase was a System76 Galago Pro. I thought after uh, playing with the Pop OS that uh, System76 has developed a bit that the, is there any reason I couldn't get BSD going on this thing? Turns out the answer is no. No, there isn't, and it works pretty decently. Uh, so to get some accounting stuff out of the way, 
I test this on a on FreeBSD head and on 11.1 .1 and found that as of uh, May 10th, 2018, head is a fast moving target. So uh, some of this is only bound to get even better. So the hardware is, uh, it's a core i5, eighth generation, has the Intel Ultra HD Graphics 620, 16 gigs of RAM, uh, and a Realtek for, uh, 8411B uh, card reader, a Realtek 8111 gigabit ethernet adapter, uh, Intel HD audio, and a Samsung 960 Pro NVMe SSD. Uh, so he says the caveats, uh, there are a few things I can't uh, seem to make work straight out of the box, and that's the SD card reader, uh, the backlight, and the audio can be a bit finicky. Also, the trackpad doesn't respond to two-finger scrolling. Um, they've updated the FreeBSD laptop wiki, uh, and there are a few edits that need to be made still, uh, but there is a bug where I can't uh, create an account for that right now. Might need to reach out uh, once we get the wiki fixed there. Hmm. So looking at graphics, uh, the boot menu itself um, sets itself to what looks like uh, 1024 by 768 in the middle of the screen. I think it might actually be 800 by 600. Uh, but as soon as uh, the kernel starts, the text console goes to the full uh, 3200 by 1800 resolution, uh, and the text mm. is ultra small. I remember helping Colin fix that in the airport lounge on the way home from BSD Cambridge last year. <laughs> um, we changed the does. font or something to make the text four times bigger and then it was readable <laughs> okay uh, but once you get into X windows it requires the DRM kmod next or I think it's DRM next kmod uh, package uh, which provides the latest Intel graphics drivers uh, once installed uh, follow the directions from the package and it works with almost no fuss I have it running on X with full Intel acceleration and had it running at its full 1200 by 1800 resolution. To scale that down, uh, they used X render, uh, X R and R and set the scale to uh, 50%, uh, which blows it up roughly 200% and makes it much easier to see on your tiny laptop screen. Hmm. I learned at BSD Canada there's a program called Auto X R and R that tries to do all these things manually or uh, automatically, of course. Um, but it's not in ports, so I oh, may need uh, to... Well, I use one called a R and R. Uh, yeah, it is imports and it gives you a nice little dialogue and you can drag the screens back and forth and set them up how you want. And that's oh. how I've uh, made my laptop work uh, with every projector I've ever played it into with minimal fuss. Oh, well, check this out. Maybe it's that the, uh, the one I was. It um, might actually be the same one. That's maybe what the A and uh, yeah. A R and R stands for. <laughs> little but abbreviation. That's what I use. It's a little one called A R and R because I got a slight giggle out of watching uh, Colin Purcell and Rod Grimes grokking through the X R and R man page trying to find the right switches to configure <laughs> their screen when I just went click click click. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good to know the tool. Uh, yep. So then uh, for wireless, that laptop has an Intel. 8265, same as what's in my X270. So you just uh, load the IWM driver and you're good to go. Uh, battery, he says, it seems to be getting about five hours out of the battery, but everything reports out of the box as expected. I could get more by throttling the CPU down speed wise. Uh, this is where I'm lucky with the X270. I'm getting about 12 hours of battery life under FreeBSD. Um, Part of that is the particular model of processor I have it has this system called up down TDP, where based on the clock speed, it changes not just uh, kind of the draw the of the processor, but also its uh, thermal frequency. So if you're running it at I think under a gigahertz, it drops down to being a seven watt processor instead of its default fifteen watts, uh, which means you can get even more battery life. And once you go over two gigahertz, I think is the, the mark, uh, it actually kicks up to be a 25 watt processor. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can burn through that battery very quickly if you want to build world really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. you know, if it's plugged in, you can kick, kick it up a notch. Yeah, and on the other times you but, slow down. You know, just out of the box without having done anything to try to save battery, uh, I'm getting like 12 hours of battery out of it. So I'm mm. very happy. Okay, that's a decent amount of uh, Yes, uh, I think this juice. in particular why George 
uh, returned his his Galley GoPro and went for the X270 was just about battery life. Uh, but Collins kept his and is quite happy with it as well. Uh, I have to ask Colin what he's how he's doing for battery life, and maybe he found a couple of the right switches to make the battery last a bit longer. Oh yeah, I think the CPU might have that same up down TDP thing, and just uh, setting that correctly could make uh, you know. 15 watts versus 25 watts this makes a very big difference uh in how long the battery is going to last last if it provides you know 60 watt hours um yeah 60 divided by 25 is a lot less than 60 divided by 15 <laughs> and so on uh so anyway the conclusions uh from the blog post is that it's a pretty decent experience while it's not as polished as the thinkpad there are some positives uh with a bit of work and polishing in particular that screen resolution is much higher than the uh 1920 by 1080 you get on uh the the x230 and the laptop itself is not bad the keyboard is nice and responsive uh the build quality is pretty solid my only real complaint is that the trackpad is stiff to click and sort of tiny. <laughs> Sorry. Well, bless you. I imagine the stiffness in the trackpad will go down over time, um, and it's stiff specifically so that it doesn't get kind of loose too soon. Mm, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's a good point. If people know, um, or sh should people should retest their machines after like three or six months to see how everything now works, whether the keys are more stuck now or less stuck. Uh, we should definitely hope that uh, the people that are writing these about their new laptops uh, will keep us up to date over time. Uh, anyway, they say uh, they seem to be a bit indifferent uh, to non-Linux OSs running on the gear, but this isn't anything new. I won't have any problems using it, and it's enough that uh, when I work uh, through this laptop, but... Uh, not sure at this stage if my next machine will be another System76, uh, or if, uh, you know, go back to Lenovo or something. Uh, but they say they have impressed me enough to put them in the running when I go for my next portable machine, however many years down the road. Okay. Well, people who are in the market for a laptop might want to check this out, especially when they're running FreeBSD. And I guess the other BSDs are also well enough supported to make a decent uh, machine. Okay, uh, next up we have hardware... We have Alan sneezing, of course. Uh, <laughs> we cut that out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's in my head. Um, hardware accelerated AS HMAC SHA on Octeons over at undeadly.org. And that means OpenBSD. So we have here um, a commit. Uh, by uh, Visa at OpenBSD, interesting name, uh, that's been submitted but disabled for now to use built-in acceleration for on Octeon CPUs, much like AES&I for x86. And uh, they decided to test uh, TCP Bench and IPsec before and after updating and enabling the OctoCrypto, aptly named, uh, driver. Uh, they didn't capture detailed performance stats from before the update. They had heard uh, someone say that edge router light boxes uh, would only do some 6 megabits per second over IPsec. So they set up a really simple IPsec conf with iKey ESP, the um, encapsulated security protocol, I think, yeah, uh, from A to B, leading to a policy of uh, ESP tunnel from A to B, SPI, dead beef, auth, uh, HMAC SHA2 256 ENC AES, so very simple rule here for IPsec. So going from one ERL to another, uh, they <laughs> he collects ox or they collect oxia, oct octeons. Uh, so they have a bunch to test with and let TCP bench run for a while on that. Uh, the numbers uh, hovered around at seven megabytes per second, megabits per second, sorry, uh, which coincided with uh, what they've heard and also that most of the CPU gets used while doing it. Then editing the generic kernel on Octeon, uh, removing the uh, comment on the Octo Crypto Zero uh, on mainboard mainbus zero and recompiled, booting into the new kernel and got the Octo Crypto line and D message, which means that the kernel has activated that device. Uh, it was time to rock the IPsec tunnel again. The crypto algorithm and HMAC used by default on IPsec coincides nicely with the list of accelerated functions provided by the driver. So here's a couple of numbers. Uh, 
before the tunnel traffic numbers. Just one trick, quick look at the sys that picks, uh, which says while the IPsec is running at full steam. So we can see here that uh, there's crypto, there's softnet, there's TCP bench, and um, CPUs are roughly 50% uh, used, so that's not too bad. Uh, so this indicates that the load from doing IPsec and generating the traffic is somewhat nicely evened out over the two cores in the edge router, and there's even some CPU left unused, which means uh, they can actually SSH into it and have it usable. Uh, having it running for almost two days now, moving some 2.1 terabytes over the tunnel. Well, that's that's something uh, more up to our edge here. Uh, now for the new and improved performance numbers. So this is um, the comparison table. Uh, the TC bench numbers fluctuate up and down a bit, but the output is, is nice enough to actually keep tabs on the peak values, uh, peaking to 58.8 megabits per second. Oh, wow, that's it's an improvement. Big improvement from seven. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, of course, as you can see, the average is lower, but nice anyhow. A manifold yeah, uh, increase in average performance. Average is 36 to 40 by look. Oh, yeah, that's still... <laughs> acceptable uh, over the seven megabits per second. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that uh, increase of performance is good uh, enough in itself, but also moves the throughput from a speed that would make a poor uh, but cheap gateway to something actually useful and decent for many home network speeds. So the biggest problem after this uh, gets enabled will be uh, that my option to buy cheap used ERLs diminishes. <laughs> yes, he's... <laughs> Predicting there will be a run on these because uh, once he fixes them, they'll be pretty good. Yeah, so remember this is disabled in by default, so you have to actually um, recompile the kernel and make that um, uncommented in the kernel source. So you have the octo crypto or oct crypto, and with that, you can start IPsecing at a much higher speed on OpenBSD. Uh, and a user on the forum there says, uh, this is incredible, thank you for the work. The question I have is, why is this still disabled? Is there more work to be done? Uh, can't wait to put this on my both of my Octeons and aiming for some weeks down the line. And another developer chimes in, must be because it's super unstable. You should just send me all your Octeon hardware instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that also works um, for testing and stabilization. Uh, well, no, I think uh, this person's <laughs> just trying to get uh, free Octeons. Well, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if um, people use that, there's much more testing being done and then they can fix the remaining bugs and stability issues. Time for Beastie Bits this week. We have using FreeBSD text dumps over at etink.com. E Interesting domain name. Um, emerging technologies. Ah, that explains it. Yes. Uh, uh, so if you need to debug a panic on a remote FreeBSD system, but don't want to transfer large core dumps uh, from that remote system to your system to do the debugging, and can't afford the downtime caused by dropping into the KDB de uh, debugger screen, uh, a text dump may be the answer. If you read the text dump man page, uh, it's a kernel dump facility which allows you to see the crash information in a pure text format. Basically, you script KDB getting the debug information you need when it crashes and writing it to a text file uh, so that when you reboot, you'll have it all there. Uh, it also allows to configure exactly what information is captured by scripting the input. Uh, text dump uh, has certain requirements. Uh, you must be running at least FreeBSD 7.1. It's been around a while, but you, know, you never know. Uh, and your kernel config must enable the DDB, KDB, and KDB unattended uh, features, as well as KDB trace. Uh, text dump also relies on the uh, dump dev and save core features. So because if the kernel is panicking, we can't trust the file system drivers because they might be what panicked, uh, we write unstructured, well, only slightly structured data to the swap device. Uh, so use dump dev to declare which device you would like to crash dump to. And then on boot up, save core checks if that device contains a dump. And if it does, saves it out to uh, the var crash directory on your real file system uh, before letting swap, you know, get to work using the swap as swap. Uh, both of these uh, are in, need to be enabled in rc.conf. Uh, dump dev can be set to auto and it will just use the first swap device. Uh, or you can 
name a device specifically and actually could choose a not swap device if you want it. Uh, do not specify a UFS file system device name or path here. Only swap can be used as the kernel can't rely on the file system during a panic. Also note that you uh, must either or must ensure that the default target directory var crash exists uh, and has enough space. If you want to put it somewhere else, you have to change dumpter in rc.conf. Okay, but other than that, it goes on and uh, describes how to do it and how to test it. Uh, and you should look at that if uh, you're interested in figuring out what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is a great item for us. Uh, LLVM's LLD is now the default linker for AMD64 on FreeBSD. And we have to thank this person for it. Let's see whether that works. Uh, it's uh, too dark. Uh, yeah. Yep. Uh, here it goes. <laughs> so, uh, but he so, was not alone. Uh, there were a lot of other people involved, but um, he did the final yep. commit that we are having here. Yep. So Ed writes in the commit message: the migration to LLVM's LLD linker has been uh, in progress for quite some time. About three years ago, uh, Ed opened an upstream LLVM metabug to track all the issues that prevented FreeBSD using LLD as his linker. And about 1.5 years ago, requested the first X run. Uh, which is an attempt to compile all 30,000 packages on FreeBSD using the LLD as a system linker. Uh, and it found many problems, and that resulted in many fixes to LLD, many fixes to ports, and you know a year and a half of effort to eventually get to the point where it works good. Mm -hmm. uh, as of uh, a recent-ish commit, uh, they enabled the LLD bootstrap by default on AMD64, so that would use LLD as the linker to link the kernel and the world when they're built, uh, but still use the GNU LD uh, as the linker that gets installed. So your FreeBSD compiled from source would be set up with LLD, but the, LL, the LD linker installed on the system after would be the GNU one so that uh, any packages that uh, didn't work with LLD yet wouldn't stop compiling. But the vast majority of issues observed when building ports with LLD as the system linker have now been solved. Uh, and so they've now enabled LLD is LD so that the LD command installed by default will be the LLVM one, not the GNU one. A small number of port failures remain and uh, these will be addressed in the near future. Special thanks to Antoine for handling the X friends over and over and over again. And, uh, Cry on at for investigating many port failures and adding the LLD unsafe flag to those so that it will get a GNU linker to link them with. Or other fixes or workarounds and also to everyone who helped investigate, fix, and tag uh, different ports. Yeah, so thank you. That was a big effort and making us uh, one step closer to a uh, GPL-free toolchain in the base system. So, next up is a blog post by Michael W. Lucas about author discoverability, which ties nicely into the BSD CAN, which he and we were, and 200, uh, how many? <laughs> 77, 77 other people. Other people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he writes, I'm at BSD CAN, so it's a great time to talk about the dis discoverability aspect of being a writer. My goal is to make a living as a writer for the rest of my life. My literary craftsmanship affects that, but it's not the biggest factor. When you read a book, a couple things can happen. You might get quit reading partway through and forget about it. You might read the book, take what you need, and move on. Or if the author twiddles your brain just right, you will track down everything else the author has written and buy it all. As a matter of craft, I need to improve my writing so that it's more likely that people who happen to encounter my books experience that addictive dopamine rush. Uh, but as a business, that's inefficient. Business can grow, stagnate, or wither. I can scrape on my stagnation, but eventually my current readers will die and my business will wither. Yes, yes, dead readers are the tragedy, and I will mourn each and every one of you. But more importantly, they'll interfere with paying my mortgage. So, so I need to grow my business, which means expanding my readership. Growth means exposing my work to new readers. Every reader exposed to my text risks experiencing the dopamine rush and suffering addiction. This is called advertising. 
I appreciate all the folks who tell others about my work. Frankly, a person's word to a friend is the most powerful advertising you can have. But in some ways, I've reached uh, market saturation. So if you run a BSD, if you've been exposed to my books, if you watch BSD now, that's this one podcast that you might have heard about, uh, you know who I am. I'm grateful that Alan and Benedict admit that I exist. Well, yeah, we had a good time last week. So, uh, And yeah, you write good books, Michael. Um, Parts of the non-BSD world know I exist. Every time Julia Evans says something nice about me, I get a sales surge. Nixcraft supports my work with reviews and public statements. These folks help pay my bills. So I know my work can generate appeal beyond my core BSD crowd. I'm not looking for other podcasts to appear on for both fiction and nonfiction. Actually, Michael Lucas asked us um, whether we could do another interview with him, so we'll make uh, that of work course. in the future. Yeah. So he'll be on IT in the D on July 30th. A couple of other podcasts are in discussion, so we should look out for that. Ideally, though, a book sells itself. A book generates buzz. One book that hits drags in many new readers. I fit a viral hit in the last 12 months. A, br- a book brought in more readers than any podcast I've been on. That book is, of course, Savaged by System D. Uh, when something works, do it again, but differently. Maybe as a dystopia rather than satire, and with blockchain instead of System D. Uh, yeah, so there is a uh, bit dazzled by blockchain now. I saw the book at the conference. Uh, in unrelated news, I'm a bad person and I should feel bad. Okay, yeah, so definitely spread the word about um, authors you like. And if uh, one is Michael W. Lucas, you might as well um, yeah, recommend that twice to two people. <laughs> okay, um, next up is Pledge and Unveil in OpenBSD. That's a PDF here. That seems like a... This is oh. a slide uh, from Bob's talk at BSD Game. Ah, that's, I haven't seen that yet. Okay. Good to uh, to have that already available, so you can see what the talk was all about. Of course, the audio will come later uh, if you're and missing video. a couple of pieces. But um, for the text, that should get you at least an idea what's this all about. And if this is something, so I think uh, now is a great time to mention we've been talking about BSD Can all episode here, and you're probably really sad if you missed it uh, and regretting that. So now is the <laughs> right time uh, to finish up your submission. For EuroBSDCon in uh, Bucharest, Romania in September. Uh, Four days left. Yeah. The 20th to the 23rd. Uh, and yes, you have until Sunday, uh, so that's June 17th, to submit your proposal to be one of the speakers or tutorial givers uh, at EuroBSDCon. Yes, uh, don't miss out on Romania. Expected, oh, sorry. Presentations are expected to be 45 minutes and delivered in English. Tutorials are expected to be two and a half to three hours or a full day uh, with five to six hours and also in English. Um, If you head over to the registration.eurobsdcon.org site, uh, you can uh, enter your uh, submission. Uh, Just need a short, concise text description of what you're going to talk about, like a hundred words. It's not demanding at all. Um, And also, you know, a short bit about you and uh why you why we would want you as a speaker and you know what makes you a good uh, authority on the topic you're going to speak about and lastly an estimate of your travel expenses uh because the conference will take care of travel expenses uh and lodging expenses for you to come speak at the conference yeah exactly and that's one more reason to you to submit something to get there And another um, possibility for you to get there is by applying to the Paul Schenkeveld Travel Grant um, for Eurobeast to come. If you would like to just attend the conference uh, but are not financially able to, um, if you're a good candidate, you can apply for the Paul Schenkeveld Memorial Travel Grant. Uh, Submissions are due by June 15th. You actually have a bit less time for that one. Uh, You need to get that in by Friday. Uh, and they will pick uh, the most deserving candidate uh, and uh, make sure they get to the conference. So that covers uh, the, the entrance into the conference, the lodging, and the travel. Yeah, you don't have to speak if you don't want to, but at least you get into the BSD space and see what the conference is like. Yep. All right. Um, I've 
I, so a couple of people approached me at BSD Can. Hey, Benedict. And I was like, who are you? Uh, oh, well, I know you from BSD now. Well, of course, but you, I don't know you. So they introduced themselves and I asked them, what's your favorite part of the show? And at least a couple of them said the feedback and questions section. But before we go into that one, we uh, should present a sponsor for that part, which is Tarsnap, of course. Head over to tarsnap.com to get your online backups for the truly paranoid setup if you haven't done that already. Yep, uh, Tarsnap again sponsored the FreeBSD Developer Summit, uh, paying for the nice t-shirts that we all got. Yep, uh, uh, on the back side here. <laughs> yep. uh, so yes, it, uh, you definitely need your backups, and so you should do them securely. And if you want to do them securely, the only good solution for that is Tarsnap. Head over to tarsnap.com slash BSD now and sign up. Uh, it only costs 25 cents per gigabyte uh, per month, and you get to store your backups in a way that they are 100% safe. Uh, they're encrypted on your machine um, before they're sent to the cloud, and only you have the key. And as long as you protect that key, you will be the only person able to decrypt them. Yes, and they're deduplicated. So between the archives, there will be deduplication happening, so you don't have to upload. Let's say you have a 17 gigabytes of uh, Tarsnap backups, which basically comes up to, if you divide, if you multiply this, by the 25 cents. This is just uh, f roughly four dollars. And yeah. so you don't you do the first backup and then you do the second backup with a couple of deltas in between. So you don't have to actually pay for another 70 gigabytes because right. you well, only have the like delta. The two megabytes of data that changed. And then you compress it. So actually you're paying for 0.8 megabytes of data that changed. Yeah, and you can let Tarsnap simulate how much you would have to pay before um, doing all that backup so you can actually make a better judgment about how big the costs are. You can find examples in their documentation in the getting started and uh, general use case. Or um, figure out, first of all, um, is Tarsnap supported on my operating system? And you should find that in the download section and that should be pretty much cover all the Unixes of this world as well as Mac OS X and Windows subsystem for Linux. Yeah, so in the end, uh, it only takes a couple of minutes to make your backups. It's like sign up, put in $5, uh, download the client, generate a key, and do a backup. Um, it's so fast, we'll just stop here and wait <laughs> until you're finished, and then you come back and tell us, and then we'll, we'll do the rest of the show. Dum, dum, dum. Dum, dum. I, I see you not doing it yet. You should do it. Yeah, yeah. just add it to CronTap. Think about it. It'll be done. Yeah. Anyway. On to the feedback. Yeah. So the first one is from Casey uh, about ZFS on DigitalOcean. That goes, hi, I love the show. I have run a droplet on DigitalOcean before, but wanted to use ZFS. Since that is not available by default for the base system, I decided that I would uh, just get some block storage and use ZFS on that, so I can use IOCage uh, to run some jails on my droplet. I found it hard to figure out how to do that and could not find any guide to help. Do you know of a good guide to use to help me with that? Um, first of all, um, I don't know how long ago you created your droplet, but you can create uh, ZFS-based system droplets on FreeBSD for at least the last nine months, and probably yeah. more than that. So um, when you create a new droplet, when you select FreeBSD uh, instead of Linux in the uh, web interface, there's a drop down and let you pick the version of FreeBSD and you'll see 11.1, .1, and then below that, 11.1 .1 ZFS. And that'll actually do a default all ZFS system for you. So uh, ZFS on the base system is actually, takes exactly the same amount of time as doing it on UFS. It's just yep. clicking the slightly different version number. Uh, for the block storage, after you attach the block storage device to your droplet, it'll just show up as an extra device, like DA0 or something. Uh, and then you just create a pool the same way you would with a real disk. Uh, freebsd.org slash handbook and check out the ZFS chapter. But basically, zpool, create, whatever you want to call your pool, and then the name of the device, like DA0 or whatever that has uh, the block storage, and you'll have a pool. It's that easy. Yep. So, as Alan said, the easy West. it's available. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, next question is from Jürgen um, with uh, a question. Well, easy, but hi, Alan and Chris. Ah, that seems like an old one. 
but I can uh, <laughs> I can take that still. Uh, first of all, thanks for the great show. I enjoy it every week. Uh, I was just confused by Alan's concluding words about his conference workflow using Git slash SVN on ZFS. Uh, he said, uh, if you use Git, you definitely want to use snapshots so you can undo things. I'm sure he meant SVN. Git never mutates existing objects, the tree, the commits, the blobs. And if you change your local history, uh, do a rebase or a reset, you can recover the previous state of the ref using the Git ref log. Uh, or ref log. Yeah. Um, I was talking about Git, definitely. Um, and it was more about the stuff that's not actually in the Git bit yet. Um, I don't know. It's mostly because I'm pretty new with Git, but I've managed to make terrible messes that involved me just RMRFing the entire Git thing, getting a new one, and doing it again. Uh, where snapshots let me save a bit of that pain there. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of Git commands just don't do what I expect them to do and cause me headache. Uh, but, you know, I snapshot everything all the time, uh, so I can undo a problem, whether it's with SVN or Git. It's very nice. Yeah, if you use that... Um you have basically the file system as your uh, version control system. Well, as a backup version control from my version <laughs> control system, but yeah. Yeah, keeping it in the, uh, on ZFS uh, makes it uh, more robust and safe. All right, um, hope that answered the question. Uh, next up is Kevin with a failover best practice uh, question, I guess. Uh, big fan of the show. He writes, I want to run a web server with failover or load balancing particularly so I can take one node offline for updates and the other will continue to serve traffic. I don't want to be tied to one VPS provider or operating system. I currently have OpenBSD 6.3 on Vulture and Fedora 28 on DigitalOcean. Can this be done at the DNS level? What's the difference between round-robin DNS and any cast DNS? And what is a good primary or secondary DNS provider who supports these and DNS sec? Okay. Um, so that's so interesting. Doing it across providers is a bit more difficult. You have to do it in DNS. And the slight issue with DNS is it's never going to be as fast as you wish. Right? With CARP, you can fail over to a different machine in milliseconds. Uh, with DNS, you're talking probably minutes. You can get it to single-digit minutes, but it's still going to be minutes. So yeah, the propagation. If it's is going still... down for planned maintenance, that's not so bad. You can switch the traffic over, wait, and then take down the machine once the traffic is switched over. Uh, for unplanned things, it does mean there is uh, some period where things are down. Um, but anyway, um, yes. Uh, at Scale Engine, we do this at the DNS level a little more for load balancing than for failover, but for both. Um, so the problem with the round robin DNS is that you just tell the client, here's a list of IP addresses, and generally the DNS resolver library that's part of the operating system returns just one value to the application. So your browser sees the one IP. It doesn't have all of them, so the browser can't be smart and be like, oh, the first one didn't work, let me try the second one, because it doesn't know that level of detail. The kind of the DNS API kind of hides it from that, hides that from the app. Um, so round robin is probably not what you want. You would uh, need a DNS server where either using some like dynamic updates or something to change the records, or a DNS server that actually knows how to do this, uh, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, AnyCast DNS is slightly different. The idea there is while you list one or more name servers for the domain, that name server actually exists in multiple different locations on, in the world, uh, but all with the same IP address. And the traffic is routed to whichever one is closest. So with AnyCast DNS, uh, you, know, you could have a DNS server in California and one in New York that have the same IP address. And then any traffic coming from a user uh, will go whichever one is the fewest hops away uh, and the traffic in that one will answer. Um, so different users will get a talk to a different name server while all sending packets to the same IP address. That's how Anycast works. Uh, mm -hmm. So Anycast is kind of a, a feature to make DNS faster, but it's not actually really related to what we're talking about here, uh, which is failover. Although mm -hmm. it can be used for a bit of that in that you know, you can have the server in New York always return, uh, you know, your say your DigitalOcean droplet in New York, uh, and the server in California always return the IP of your Volter server that's in California somewhere or whatever. So, um, 
for doing this yourself, uh, the open source software I use is called GDNSD, uh, and it can do things like check the website and make sure it's returning 200 uh, in the DNS server. And if it's not, it knows the second IP address for your backup web server and actually changes the DNS record. Uh, so we can actually monitor, a, basically you set up a round robin, but tell it only return IPs that are up. So it'll automatically remove any server that's down from the round robin results it gives out and so on. Um, for a provider that does that, um, before GDNSD existed and before I was using it, uh, I did simple failover with uh, dnsmadeeasy.com, uh, which is a big Anycast DNS hosting company, uh, and they have support for this failover feature. I'm not sure about their support for DNSSEC off the top of my head, though. Uh, I had a very similar question uh, from another FreeBSD developer a couple of weeks ago. I might ask uh, Ryan um, Simetz, uh if he ended up finding a provider and pass that along to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that should give you a couple of pointers to uh, failover solutions. Um, I'm going to read the next one uh, from Dennis. That's a bit longer. Uh, that goes... Thank you, uh, by the way, for a really great show. Uh, it is one show of a very few actual substantial technical content for developers and administrators. I've been watching and listening for a few for years by now. Uh, I hope you are as entertained as your audience must surely be. Yeah, we have fun. <laughs> so, um, he's looking forward to each new episode every week when bicycling forth and back to my work here in the States in Denmark in Scandinavia on top of that little peninsula on top of Germany guarding the sea entry to the Baltic Sea. Wait, pardon me. The same country where alumni FreeBSD developers Paul Henningkamp and Urban Lansing are living at the moment. Yeah, that they're uh, there. Actually, Paul Henningkamp actively committed something recently. So, maybe he's not that alumni. Yeah, but Irvin is. I took his uh, seat at the foundation. Uh, and he gave his pit in. Yes, I remember. Yeah. Well, maybe he's coming back one day, so that's still a possibility. So, um, have you seen this article by Percona, one of the important companies in the MySQL MariaDB ecosystem, mostly known for their solid online backup system for MySQL and MariaDB and other tools? So, there's a link here. Yeah. Um, that's ZFS. I think so, we covered that yes, one. I've been aware point. of Percona for a while because I actually used their fork of MySQL before MariaDB. I actually ran the per, uh, the Percona fork uh, before MariaDB basically gained most of those features. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, you can go ahead. Uh, one yeah, thing I will note uh, so is that this article bits. is from November of last year. Yeah, so um, the extract here is that uh, TastyBits backups of roughly 400 gigabyte databases from almost possible to a few seconds. With ZFS, we can safely disable InnoDB checksums. So it seems rather a good overview, he writes, uh, of ZFS for database use, but I'll leave that judgment to Alan. Uh, there are some additional links at the bottom of the article expanding to a series of articles. Um, and oh, a third thing, I tried in vain to use the contact form on Jupyter Broadcasting website, but the submit button is actually missing in a Safari browser on the iPhone. Okay, I had to wait until getting home to a real computer to submit this. Oh. Um, you can always email feedback at bsdnow.tv directly as well. Yeah. Um, so about the Percona article, yes. So they were talking a bit about how ZFS can make you be able to do backups a lot better. Uh, basically, because you can snapshot it, replicate it, then replicate, do an incremental replication to catch up for, you know, it may have taken days to do the backup. Um, once you get the delta very low, you can lock the database, take another snapshot, then unlock it, um, and finish the, the last incremental and, and be able to bring up a uh, an extra replica of that database very, very quickly without any downtime compared to the traditional tools. Um, they also have had articles about performance analysis they've done of ZFS versus XFS. In the first one, they found ZFS to be quite a bit slower, um, but in the second one, they found uh, where they were doing things not quite in a way that didn't align very well with ZFS. And by making a couple of minor changes, suddenly uh, they were managed to get almost double the performance out of ZFS compared to XFS. You know, ZFS is doing more work than other file systems, so it's expected to be a bit slower. But 
if you uh, align things quite right, you can take advantage of some of the advanced features of ZFS, like the compression, uh, the compressed arc, and just the better caching um, to actually get even better performance. Yep, that should be uh, your backup way of using that more efficiently. Yes, uh, but I'm I'm glad to see the Percona people uh, talking more about ZFS, including actually presenting at the ZFS user conference in April. Uh, so there's video of that, uh, and we covered it in a recent episode, but you can get the videos from uh, zfs.dato.com, D-A-T-T-O. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in case you want to run similar setups or uh, see how much performance you can get out of that. Okay, uh, thanks for your feedback and uh, questions this week. Uh, we kind of reached the episode end for this week. Remember, next week we'll cover the BSD CAN uh, actual conference. Uh, but in the meantime, send us questions, comments. Maybe you've been a first-timer to the conference or a recurrent uh, visitor and you have your own views about the conference, how things went. Uh, let us know at feedback at bsdnow.tv or anything else you found on the internet. Um, we'll cover it in a future episode then. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week where we'll have even more stuff about BSD Camp and more answers to your questions and uh, whatever else you send us to talk about. So email us at feedback at bsdnow.tv and tell us what you'd like to hear more of. You know, we do the show for you, so it might as well be about the things you want it to be about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you want to see and hear the things you care about. <laughs> <laughs>